with the portal opening officially on Monday, December 4th. But that did not stop people from saying, I'm going into the portal. And it certainly did not stop media from going, this person is likely to go into the portal. And now, as we have had portal entrance, it is time to take a look at which quarterbacks have decided to throw their names in their grad transfer or not, and where you should probably slot them. So I really have come up with two tiers here because I didn't think that it was doing justice to do a top five list about the top five available quarterbacks in the transfer portal because, quite frankly, there are more than five. And I don't think about them in exactly the same way, and we've learned this because – there has become a difference in the kind of quarterback you go get in the transfer portal. A lot of that has to come to what do you already have that you know is going to be there come August? And what are your aspirations as a football program if you are being realistic about your aspirations? So let's start with the first tier that I want to talk about, which is called experienced winners. I want winners. That's Mike Singletary for those of y'all that just weren't around for my, the Mike Singletary Singletary era at San Francisco, but I really love that quote because we play the games to win the or play the sport to win the games. Yeah, that's Herm Edwards. I keep going, but point here is that these dudes have shown us that they know exactly how to go win football games, even if they don't necessarily have the stats or even the skill set to say to us, we think this dude could be potentially great. Now, if you are a winner, you already could be potentially great. So I think that part is. Uh, really baked into the experienced winners. But let's get to basically the first name on the list that I have here is Riley Leonard, who has gone into the portal after what started out as a really outstanding year for Duke, who got to be ranked inside the top 25 for the first time in 30 damn years, coming off of a nine-win season last year. Mike Elko has since taken his job and made it the Texas A&M job. We got to see Duke was off on the good foot, bright and early with their upset of Clemson. Basically because Riley Leonard and the defense willed it to be so. In that game, Leonard damn near rushed for 100 yards, had 98, had 175 yards passing through the air. Now, that's the thing. He's not going to be the kind of guy that has lit up a stat sheet when it comes to throwing the ball around. Maybe that can change. I don't necessarily think that it does. However, I look at Riley Leonard, I'm going, dog, I wish you'd have been along when we were absolutely in that space of Urban Meyer and, well, that spread option. Right. Like it was a lot of fun to watch that triple option that they have going on there because you had a dude like Riley Leonard, JT Barrett. Right. Who could run it? Cardell Jones, who could run it? I don't know that that offense is in vogue right now, but that would be where I want to put him. But it also makes sense that there are programs that have already looked at him and said, that guy knows how to win football games. We can be good with him if we give him good pieces, because that's also the thing about Duke is who else on that offense do you think was, well, an experienced winner? It really came down to what he was able to provide to them. And we know this because, yeah, he beat Clemson. But the thing that I really focused on was that dude had Duke up in Tallahassee against Florida State on one leg. They were winning the game 20 to 17 until he was knocked out of it. And then Florida State did what we all thought Florida State was going to do from the jump. But it was very clear that Duke had a chance to win every football game that Riley Leonard started for them this year. It's just the numbers weren't there. And then, you know, the ankle and him being able to come back off of it. And then what Mike Elko has decided to do, you don't begrudge that dude going into the portal. Also, you know, it's it's a dude that was asking for an extension on a paper because he's playing a football game. And at Duke, they just don't, they frown on that kind of thing. Whereas Texas A&M, I don't know. Maybe they let it go. Maybe they say, did you go win? Cool. Then we'll give you the pass because everybody's on board with that. I'm joking here, but I think Riley Leonard is going to be at a power five spot. It's just which one. I know right now there are feelers out there that Notre Dame is the thing and Notre Dame might be the done thing. And we know that Notre Dame likes a good ACC quarterback, see Sam Hartman. But I don't know that Riley Leonard makes Notre Dame into a national championship program on his own. He's going to need help and they're going to go into the portal and try to find him that help. Say nothing of what Tobias Merriweather losing him might mean to you. I just don't know that he is the top on this list for me, right? I'm sure that there's something there for someone. But if you were telling me that Ohio State is in on Riley Leonard, then I got to also reevaluate that, too, because, well, I'm going to get to that. But first, I want to talk about the next guy on the list. DJ Uwe Anglele has gone in the transfer portal because, like Riley Leonard, his head coach has taken another Power 5 job. Jonathan Smith, now the new head coach at Michigan State. There's already been some scuttle about DJ Uwe Anglele deciding to join Jonathan Smith in East Lansing, but that's a program that's really down it's going to take some time to rebuild it. 
I don't know that Jonathan Smith is the dude to flip it over in a year because he has not shown that he wants to build a roster that is basically coming out of the portal. But he has shown that he will want to go get a transfer quarterback that he thinks can affect winning. And I think DJ can affect winning at any Power 5 level at any school. We got to see this when he was at Clemson coming in in relief of Trevor Lawrence and going for four bills against Notre Dame. He has the goods. He brought Clemson down from 18 back against Boston College in Death Valley. You might also argue, why do you need to come from 18 back against Boston College? It happens, right? That's that's football. That's the sport. But did you win the game? Which is basically what Florida State is going to ask everybody from here until kingdom come. But that's also a space where I could see DJ Uyilangule really fitting in. I think DJ and Florida State would be a great marriage, given what Jordan Travis had meant to winning at FSU and what his skill set provides. If you're able to get him the kind of skill players that you have on that team, Jaheim Bell, Keon Coleman, Trey Benson, and then you can put together that same sort of defense, you got a chance to go win the ACC title in back-to-back years and make the playoff because it will be have expanded to 12 teams and you won't have to look at a bunch of suits in a boardroom who thumb their nose at your 13-0 and record. I also think that he fits for a guy like Jeff Levy at Mississippi State. That is a man that wants to make a splash quarterback transfer. Well, I was going to say higher, but I guess we could do the same thing. He would love to get that sort of a commitment from a player of DJ's caliber because it's all there, right? He's one of the tooliest guys that I've ever seen at the position. Throws a 95-mile-hour fastball. He's all a six foot five. He's all a 260 pounds. He's got a rocket for an arm, and he's got the ability to run around. It's just can you help him make better decisions as a passer? I think, yeah, he's shown us he can win, and that's precisely the kind of place where he should be going. Somebody's got conference championship winning aspirations, which is another reason why Ohio State would not seem out of the question for him, but that's kind of the thing about Ohio State. It's really not out of the question for any quarterback of any repute because that's how good they have been at the quarterback position at Ohio State, which is why this is going to become a reoccurring thing, not just in this show, but until such a time as we figure out what's going on at Ohio State, even nine months from now, which leads me naturally to the guy that put his name into the portal to some people's surprise, and Kyle McCord, quarterback at Ohio State who is only just 12-1 and as a starter, guys, who also passed for 3,100 yards this year, 24 TDs, 6 INTs, I think the ding against Kyle McCord is that when you've got Marvin Harrison Jr., yeah, you ought to be able to complete a bunch of your passes. When you've got a Mecca Buka, you ought to be able to complete a bunch of your passes. The same thing is true when you got a run game that features a guy like Travion Henderson. I would argue that Kyle McCord did more at Ohio State than J.J. McCarthy did at Michigan, and that still isn't good enough because, well, Michigan beat Ohio State. So J.J. did enough for Michigan to win, and Kyle McCord threw two interceptions in that game one of which came in the first half that I swear he wants to have back, and the last one was a last-ditch effort to try to get Ohio State in the end zone, and that was that. It's kind of tragic that his last pass thrown at Ohio State is an interception. I really do hate that for him, but I think Kyle McCord, being a five-star quarterback himself, has shown the goods to be a Power 5 starter anywhere else. As a matter of fact, when this first happened, until the Riley Leonard thing happened, I was like, well, that dude just needs to go to Notre Dame because I think that he could make them that much better because he sees the field really well. And I think that having outstanding wide receivers doesn't make him great. I think he can make wide receivers great. I think his relationship with Marvin Harrison Jr. did as much as Marvin Harrison Jr.'s talent to help them, right? I think if you give him the dudes, he's going to go out there and he's going to perform for you. But is he a better quarterback going in than Sam Hartman was last year? I can't take it that far either, right? So I think that Kyle McCord is going to help somebody. I'm just curious as to where he sees a fit for him because I think that most programs that are in the market for a quarterback will give that man a hard look if he so wants to return said hard look. So I can't wait to figure out where he goes to visit and or what he thinks he wants to do. But as an undergrad going into the transfer portal, your options aren't as available. You're kind of limited. As a matter of fact, I tell the kiddos now, graduate, because when you graduate, you can do anything you want. You don't count against scholarship distribution chart in the same way. They don't have to make sure that you are going to graduate because you've already graduated. And really, coaches don't frown upon it, right? They have to look at a guy that's an undergrad transfer and give them the what for and the how. Like, are you going to bring down our APR score? How many quarterbacks or even players do I have to give a scholarship to that are going to be around for more than one year? So forth, so on. So 
he's got a couple of hurdles to overcome, but I don't think that's going to be too big a deal for a guy of his caliber. The next guy on the list that we got to talk about is Kansas State quarterback Will Howard, who, again, experienced winner. 2,600 yards passing this year, 351 on the ground. Damn near beat Texas on the road and came off the bench last year to lead Kansas State to a Big 12 championship in a year where Texas Christian was undefeated and played in the national title game. That's not too shabby. As a matter of fact, during Big 12 media days, I asked Chris Kleiman about handing the keys to his program to a guy like Will Howard. He said, hey, it's got to be him. It's his program. He has to be the guy because he's the dude that we have decided is going to lead us possibly to another Big 12 championship. That didn't come to fruition. But I also understand why a guy like Will Howard go into the portal. Right? You see Avery Johnson come off the bench to run plays that used to be run for you. And perhaps you go, okay, well, maybe I need to go where they don't have my ready-made apparent right here running plays while I stand on the sideline perfectly healthy. I don't know that that really meant a whole lot to him, but it would mean a whole lot to me, right? Especially if I'm healthy and I think of myself as a dual-threat quarterback, and Will Howard should, and Will Howard probably does, right? He's going to be the kind of dude that I think can help a college football team win conference championships at a high level. And as far as where he fits – Dog, it's one of those where it's going to be difficult to narrow it down to because there are lots of places that he can help. Again, I'll go back to Jeff Levy, Mississippi State, who would love to have somebody that he could depend on as an experienced star to help him navigate his first year as a head coach in the SEC West, I might add. But divisions are going to go away. But you get the point there, right? Mississippi State ain't the one you worry about. When the SEC West was a thing might be the last team that you worried about because Auburn always seems to sneak up on somebody. It's also another place where Will Howard could actually end up and do well is a place like Auburn where you have a guy like Philip Montgomery that knows what to do with a dual threat quarterback and uh, quarterback's got a cannon for an arm. The next guy and the last guy that I think we need to talk about on the experienced winners list is Dylan Gabriel, who shown what he's capable of at Central Florida. And then after a six and seven year, showed what he was capable of at Oklahoma. It's not just that he threw for 3,600 yards, 30 TDs, and six picks. It's that he's a grad transfer who started a ton of games and beat Texas. Who else beat Texas? I submit to you, nobody. Nobody beat Texas except Dylan Gabriel in Oklahoma. And that was very much a Dylan Gabriel game. He led the Sooners down the field for the decisive score to knock off a previously undefeated Texas team that was so good that undefeated Florida State has to watch Texas, who lost to Oklahoma, play in the college football playoff. That is a ringing endorsement for you as a quarterback in Dylan Gabriel. It's one of the reasons why you are already hearing on Tuesday that he is planning to take a visit to Oregon, where Bo Nix is basically going to play if he hasn't played his last game, right? his last game, and they're already going to be looking to the next guy. Now, whether Ty Thompson is that guy is, you know, we'll we'll see, maybe, right? But I think that if you're Will Stein, you can show Dylan Gabriel, this is what we did with Bo Nix. The only argument would be it took Bo Nix a year to really get the hang of what he was doing in Oregon, and then you changed up the offense coordinator, so maybe that's not entirely fair. But Will Stein was also one of the Broyles Award finalists and, and seems to be staying right where he is as Oregon – is going to make its foray into the Big Ten. And I'm sure that they would love to have a dude with the kind of experience and the kind of talent that Dylan Gabriel has shown himself capable of at Oregon to say nothing of his Hawaii roots, right? That's that's where the great quarterbacks used to go when they come off the island. They used to go to Oregon. Like, I know everybody remembers Marcus Mariota, but my dude was always Jeremiah Masoli because as a short, tubby quarterback, I love watching that dude play football. It was so much fun. And that's kind of been the thing. It was actually kind of shocking when we didn't see Tua end up at a place like Oregon, right? When we didn't see DJ Uyunglele end up at a place like Oregon because they respect that heritage so much and they respect what those quarterbacks have done here, especially in recent years, mentioning Mariota and Masoli there. So that's where I think those guys go in the experience winners tier. And all of those guys are good. So if you end up with one, you should feel good about that. Now, Next tier we got to talk about is potentially great. I say potentially great because if you have been watching any one of these quarterbacks play football, even a little bit, you see the talent, you see the skill set. You also see some sort of polish that is needed, some mechanics that need to be fixed. 
teaching them how to read the field, basically getting them to be experienced quarterbacks. So first on the list, we're going to go to the group of five and talk about Kurt Warner's son, EJ Warner, who's put his name into the portal after having a pretty great statistical year at Temple. Threw for over 3,000 yards, 23 TDs to 12 INTs. Not great, but not awful. I mean, I submit to you that Jordan Love led the FBS in interceptions his last year at Utah State and ended up being a first-round pick by the Packers, who all of a sudden don't look like trash. So anyway, all, all I'm saying there is like the pick to INT ratio, and we might even overstate that from time to time. But EJ is a dude that has absolutely shown he can sling it. First, I got to see him do it up close and personal against my alma mater, the University of Tulsa, which wasn't that great this year, but you get the point there. And then he went 472 yards against what we all think is a good UTSA team. I think that EJ is probably looking for a Power 5 offer, but I think that Power 5 offer is closer to being in the Big 12 or the ACC than it is to be in the Big 10 or the SEC, if you get what I'm going at there. I think he's got tremendous talent, and I think with the right quarterbacks, coach, and coordinator, he can really thrive. He can really become the kind of player that we have seen really transform at the Power 5 level in like a Cam Ward. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but I think it's there for him if he finds the right spot. It's a lot like the NFL draft or the way that football people in the NFL talk about the draft. It's all about fit and do you have what you need right at that moment as much as it is about your talent and your ability to play at that level. Next on the list, another dude coming out of the group of five, but outstanding as a winner could go into the experienced winners category. It's just that Jordan McLeod played at James Madison last year, this year, right? So awesome, awesome year. For the Dukes, led by one Jordan McLeod and his head coach is now uh, at Indiana, Kurt Signetti, deciding that that's what he's going to do. So maybe that's where Jordan McLeod ends up. But you win 11 games. You're damn near undefeated. You're outstanding as a quarterback. He's going to be wanted. It's just is he going to get the opportunity to play at the power five level the way that he probably wants to? I like to think that. He's basically booking flights to Bloomington right now to just make sure everything is on the up and up, but that just might not be true, right? And if it's not, I expect that he's going to have other opportunities. NC State is in the market for quarterbacks. They're taking visits. Louisville's in the market for a quarterback. They're taking visits. Like There are places where Jordan McLeod can absolutely help some what we might think of as quote unquote lower power five, right? But Louisville, all they did was make the ACC title game, you know, so I ain't exactly lower power five, but you get my point there. If Virginia Tech or Syracuse decided they wanted to go that way, it would not shock me. Okay, the guy that I actually want to talk about the most on this list, but is not necessarily the highest rated on this list, is Georgia quarterback Brock Vandergriff. And the reason I want to do this is everybody else that I've talked about so far and everybody else that I will talk about later has started football games, and we have all seen them, for the most part, on television playing football games. Brock Vandergriff, is still one of the most likely dudes to be great that has not played a real snap of football in his career. And that's kind of remarkable as a five-star quarterback in this day and age where you feel like you got to play that guy early so that he can get an opportunity and so that everybody else sees his film. So if he's not that good, you get to say, okay, we're going to redshirt you and you're going to stick around for a little bit. Or if he is that good, maybe you do what, Dabo Sweeney actually started to make famous, which is make your freshman phenom the dude. That didn't happen at Georgia because that's just not how Kirby Smart wants his quarterbacks to be. We know this because Justin Fields was on the same depth chart as Jake Fromm, and Kirby said, I'm going to go with Jake Fromm. Had an opportunity to go with Seth, uh, to with Justin Fields instead of Stetson Bennett or even JT Daniels and you know fumble that in 2019. Anyway, point here being Brock Vandegrift, a dude from Georgia, who played his football down the street at Prince Avenue Christian, was Mr. Football in Georgia, who threw for 4,000 yards and rushed 500 yards and had 70-plus TDs in his senior year, has sat and waited his turn 2021, 2022, and now 2023. And since Carson Beck seems like the dude and seems like he's probably going to come back, or at least that's the signal that you would get from a Brock Vandegrift entering the portal, you got to understand why that dude is like, okay, cool. I have got out of here. I'm going to graduate. I'm probably going to be able to go anywhere I want to go and play. But it's also a player that I got to know very early in his recruiting process because he showed up to an Oklahoma recruiting camp 
I want to say this is June 2019 because it's certainly not June 2020. And he was throwing passes to Relique Brown, if you can remember that dude at SC, when Lincoln Riley was still the head coach at Oklahoma. And those dudes put on a clinic. Like, it was outstanding to watch them. You had a quarterback that could sling it, and then you had a Relique Brown that could do anything that he wanted in the slide and out of the backfield. And it felt like that was going to be really a tandem to watch in the future to OU. Of course, that all blew up for one reason or another, but not the least of which is Caleb Williams comes along. And you see that in your Brock Vandergriff in the 2021 class? Hey, uh, you know what? Fine. You like that dude better than me? I'll just go win back-to-back national championships in Georgia as the backup quarterback. But he'd probably be the first person to tell you he didn't win any of those championships, and he would love to lead a team to a championship. In many ways, it's kind of like Jake Browning with the Cincinnati Bengals. You just want to get him a chance. And as soon as he gets a chance, it's probably going to be all right. It's probably going to be pretty good. I'll add in here, Greg Vandegrift, his father, is an outstanding high school football coach, defensive-minded coach who raised a quarterback, which ought to scare the hell out of every defensive coordinator who's going to have to game plan for a Brock Vandegrift, but a really down man, like, like loyal. They want to not do this. They would have loved to this to work out at Georgia. But if you're Kentucky or a program that feels like it is, uh, let's move it in the right direction, Missouri, right? Even an Oklahoma, though Jackson Arnold's probably going to have something to say about that. You got to entertain this. And, and frankly, this is how I get back to USC, right? If Brock Vandegrift is there and you don't necessarily know what you got in Malachi Nelson or you don't trust it, where you don't know where you do know what you got in Miller Moss and you don't trust it, maybe you try to make that relationship work for you and sell a kid that was raised to love the SEC and Georgia on playing Big Ten football in a satellite city that is Los Angeles. Satellite meaning satellite to the Big Ten, get my point here. But I'm curious to find out where he goes because I think this dude is a unique talent. I think that he's got all the potential to be great. So I can't wait to see where he decides to go because wherever he decides to go, he's probably going to be the starting quarterback. He'll win the job. Next on the list that I want to talk about is UCLA's Dante Moore, who I was bullish on from the start. Like I really like the dude's game and I don't really read into the conversation about where he had committed or not committed until we start playing FBS football because Jamar Chase committed to three different five, five different places before he ended up at LSU. But you could see that Dante Moore's got all the talent in the world. You just want to see his maturity. You just want to see him grow up a little bit. You want to see him make better decisions and you want to see how he you want to see him react better to being benched. Frankly, I thought Dante Moore had a Jalen Milrow moment in him that we just never got to see. If that dude would have come off the bench clapping and yelling for Ethan Garbers, I think he probably gets back into that thing. And I think he probably feels better about being a Chip Kelly quarterback, especially at this time when it feels like UCLA is in its own sort of mini turmoil. But I can understand him going to the portal. The thing that I'm struggling with is where does he go play his college football? Because I have circled Michigan. And the reason I've circled Michigan is I'm assuming everything goes the way Michigan wants it to, which is to say they beat Bama in the CFP and they beat either Washington or Texas for the national championship. Jim Harbaugh takes the job with the Chicago Bears or whomever. And then perhaps you have a Jesse Mentor, Sharon Moore, maybe a Sharon Moore as your head coach. And you need a new head, uh, new quarterback because J.J. McCarthy decides it's time to bail, right? It's time to go to the NFL because he goes for 300 yards passing each one of those games and wins MVP of the Nash Championship game. That said, do I think that he would be better at quarterback for Michigan next year than Jaden Davis or Alex Rigi? I think so. Yes, I do. I, I believe in his talent that much coming out of basically that place, Detroit, Martin Luther King High School, where he was really great. But I love his release. I would like it more if he threw off his back foot instead of just kind of standing still and chucking it. But whatever works for you, my dude, I think that you got the goods. I just think you need to slow down just a little bit. Make sure that the next place you want to go is the place you want to stay, even if it ain't going well. So you can start to win back people that might think of you as really going after the Nick Starkle Award, which is how many times can you transfer in your FBS career? JT Daniels won it last year somebody's going to win it this year. might be Dylan Gabriel as we're talking about it. But I think that somebody's going to take a chance on that dude, and I hope it's a team that's got an opportunity to play for championships. Last dude on this list we got to talk about is perhaps the most bona fide star, but potentially not an experienced winner, but potentially great, and Cam Ward, Washington State's starting quarterback. Now, he came out 
Guns of Blazing from Incarnate Word. Outstanding play for Eric Morris. Eric Morris became the offense coordinator at Wazoo. He asked Cam Ward to go with him. They went. He played lights out last year. Eric Morris took the job at UNT. Cam Ward stayed. Wazoo was not that great, in the, especially in the second half of the year. It's a top 25 team to start, right? So you can ding me for not having him on the experience winners list if you would like. But I tend to think of Cam Ward as a guy that can absolutely turn a fringe national championship program into a bona fide national championship contender. This is why I think his name and Ohio State seem to go hand in hand everywhere we go. It's just when I send that text message, I never get back Cam Ward. But, you know, I'm not the only person that is sending text messages about what Ohio State might or might not be doing at quarterback because we're going to get into that. But I struggled to say which program that does not have an established starter coming back next year would not love to have Cam Ward. It is a dude that threw for 3,700 yards, 25 TDs, 9 INTs. There's lots of scuttle about how much it's going to cost in NIL money to get a quarterback of Cam Ward's caliber. Some are going to get probably what he gets. But he's the only dude right now that seems worth the money that you're going to spend, not just because he's got the talent, but because he's got the experience at this level that you are going to crave and need if you are, say, in Ohio State that might be a quarterback away from being great. Because as much as people want to ding Ryan Day, Kyle McCord might be the dude that was the least prolific of the guys he's coached so far as a head coach. And that might have held them back in a year in which the defense was, quite frankly, dynamic and amazing. You just would love to see a great Ryan Day offense married with a great Jim Knowles defense because that seems like the kind of team that wins the national championship and came real close last year with a bad defense because the quarterback play and the offensive play was so good. And I could see how Cam Ward fits for that. Also adding this little nugget, of the top five passers in FBS, Cam Ward is fourth. The guys in front of him are dudes like Bo Nix, Michael Penix Jr., and Carson Beck. And Carson Beck is only two yards in front of Cam Ward for passing yards. And remember, Carson Beck got to play in an SEC championship game, and our guy, Cam Ward, didn't get to play in an extra game. So you could see it's going to be fascinating to see where he ends up because I think as soon as he decides what he's doing – you're going to see a lot of other dominoes start to fall because I think he's number one on a lot of boards right now. And you want him to tell you no before you get to go tell somebody else yes. If you like what you've seen, consider subscribing to the number one college football show on YouTube, the Fox Sports app, or wherever you get your podcast.